take it away. Sure, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we'll do a few slides just to keep things uh, sort of uh, on course. And uh, the way Adam and I like to operate is a, a kind of a free flowing conversation. This is a, an opportunity for us to share with you uh, what we feel is a very compelling uh, need for innovation in order to grow your business. So if you have specific questions about uh, what we're talking about or just in general, we invite you to just chime on in and uh, imagine we're just sitting around a, a very giant uh, circular table. Uh, maybe there's a, a coffee or a beer in our hand and, and this is how we like to roll. This is not a, any sort of uh, uh, pontific pontification of anything. So let me share my screen. Um, hopefully you guys can see that okay. You guys see that all right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and so uh, just a quick uh, introduction. Uh, we've already done some of this, but uh, so at Spark Partners, we develop leaders who create lasting business success. That's kind of our, our uh, value to you and to our clients. And uh, uh, we really have a uh, pretty wide and deep background on business and innovation. And uh, I will let Adam uh, begin with talking about his background and then I'll kind of talk about mine. Sure, I started out as an entrepreneur, uh, sold my company, went to the Harvard Business School and uh, got addicted to the field of business strategy. Um, working with Michael Porter at school and went to work for the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, later led uh, strategy for PepsiCo and DuPont. Um, and in the 1990s, I started to have a reckoning around the notion that um, there was there was not a con coherent view as to business strategy, and nor could we identify or, or, or be able to tell people if they use strategy tools that had been developed um, at the best firms that they would be successful. There was no correlation there, and it really bothered me. So I undertook a, a study started in 1996 to try to do a longitudinal analysis of companies that did well and companies that did poorly to see if we could begin to identify, uh, you know, actual predictors of success, likelihood of success, and what sort of strategies did yield higher rates of return and greater, uh, and what the milestones were. And so that led to creating a book called Create Marketplace Disruption. And um, I've been now for about 15 years telling people the results of that study, building on it, adding to it, helping, making predictions to people about what goes on in the marketplace. For uh, nine years, I did write a um, leadership column for Forbes and I had about 90 million readers of that. I stopped doing that in 2018, end of 2018. Uh, but uh, what I do is help people try to understand how, what it takes to be more successful, uh, the triggers for success and the triggers for failure. Sorry, I, it was a slight uh, issue on my end on the technical side. Uh, so Manny Tran, I am a, a kind of a local Tucsonan. I grew up, was born here. I grew up in Douglas in uh, Cochise County and uh, was really surrounded by entrepreneurs my whole life. But I didn't really know that until much later. Uh, my grandmother has uh, successfully launched and uh, sold three uh, restaurants. My mom has restaurants. And so... Uh, because of all these uh, restaurant background, I will never own a restaurant. I know exactly what it takes to run a restaurant, and it is a very, very difficult thing. But it kind of led me to think about business in a different way. I went into engineering school and uh, because um, I just didn't know any better. Um, and so I've got a mechanical engineering degree, but really uh, fell in love with the idea of sales and marketing and really connecting people that need something with, uh, with their need. And, uh, you know, salespeople are oftentimes demonized as, you know, the slick hair and the gold and the used car thing. But in the end, the salespeople are the most successful. And, uh, you know, if you look at Steve Jobs and uh, uh, Zuckerberg, they're basically sales guys. They're, they've got something that they've got that they want to give to the world. And in order to do that, you've got to be able to sell. So that's my background. I ran a company here in town for about eight years called Azterra. I built it from scratch and had an amazing team and um, ended up uh, in 2018 um, closing it down so I could focus in on uh, additional, um, well, one thing in particular, which Doug knows about is a, a commercialization of a medical device. 
and uh, also met Adam about a year and a half ago. Uh, and about a year ago, we had a conversation about, you know, Adam, you've got something very compelling here that the, uh, the world really needs to, to hear. And I mean, obviously he's got a very uh, wide background being read over 90 million times on Forbes magazine. And I mean, he's a humble guy, otherwise he'd be, uh, we'd be here for an hour uh, listing his accolades. But really, I saw something compelling and I, I thought to myself, this could be something that could move the needle for a lot of people. This is a, uh, a content that for me would have been very useful when I run my business. And, uh, you know, as we'll talk about in a little bit later here, uh, understanding that when you're running a business, you're almost always focused on running the business. You're focused on the day-to-day -day operations, and you lose sight of where you're taking the business, the direction. And that, just that simple nugget uh, uh, would have helped me out quite a bit in uh, where I would have taken my business. So um, what we do at, at Spark Partners is really offer uh, coaching community and courses. Uh, we're, we've got a course that we're about, to, this is what we're gonna talk about today, but overall uh, we wanna to share our experiences and some of what Adam's been working on in his career and with my career. And uh, we do have a podcast that we uh, talk about once a week uh, called the Sparkcom Podcast, which is all about innovation trends and what's coming next. So I invite you all to uh, go to our website, sparkpartners.com, and uh, you can go and view our, our podcast there, or you can look us up on your favorite podcast platform under uh, uh, Sparkcom. And so it's just a way to, to keep in touch with relevant um, things happening in the world as it pertains to, uh, to trends and innovation. And so it's a really good, uh, impactful podcast. And uh, I, I, some of this is obviously going to be very self-promoting, but we also want to give you guys value in this next 45 minutes so that you can walk away and, and have a deeper understanding of how you can make some slight changes to your business that'll change the course and, uh, and give you some, uh, some level of sustainable success. So I'm going to start off with a question. This is how I first met Adam, by the way. He asked a few questions. So I'm going to ask the question. What's the difference between Tesla and General Motors? Okay, not everybody can, you know, somebody can go first. Uh, Jerry, I'm going to call you out because you're in uh, the heart of uh, General Motors. Uh, I would say uh, the, diff the main difference I see is... Um, old business versus new business all right it's good uh, anybody else want to chime in <clears throat> you can customize a tesla you can order it uh, almost off a menu okay a little sexier a little sexier yeah yeah, yeah. tesla tesla is the biggest uh, automotive company in the world in terms of value yeah you, in, you all... in a short period of time you got it all. Yeah, that's it. I mean, um, General Motors was started in 1905, com uh, combined with, uh, with four, actually 1911, 1905 was Ford. Combined, those two combined today make about, about 7 million vehicles. And their net value, the worth of their company, is less than the worth of Tesla that was created and in, in, started in 2003 and makes about 400,000 cars a year. So in a very short amount of time, Tesla was able to usurp the position of the, uh, the largest, most valuable company in the world by, by, uh, by worth. And the reason why we kind of touched on it a little bit is because they're, they're kind of giving the customer what they want. And so right now you can order um, three models of, the, of Tesla vehicles, whereas General Motors, you can order about 20 different ones but somehow people are gravitating towards, towards Tesla. And so I'm gonna ask another question and then we're gonna actually go into why specifically these are different. Okay, here's another um, good question. The difference between Amazon and Sears. So I'm gonna open it up to other people. Who else wants to answer this? One's alive and one's dead. <laughs> Okay, that's good. Yeah, Amazon much more convenient than going to Sears or trying to find a Sears location. All right, agreed. Anybody else? 
I'd say Amazon is uh, uh, innovative and they're always changing, whereas Sears is more stationary. Uh, those are all exactly right. You know what's crazy is back in 2000, uh, Sears knew that e-commerce was a thing. They knew what was coming, but they, in their infinite wisdom, decided not to, to put it all in and, and, uh, and go all in with e-commerce, which is exactly what Amazon did. If you recall at the very beginning, Amazon was all about selling books and that's all they were doing. Fast forward to today, uh, we can order everything from dog food to um, you know, the, the basic amenities of life through Amazon and have it here tomorrow. And they're pushing right now the envelope so that uh, by this same time next year, likely, there'll be a whole host of things you can order and have it the same day. And so you can imagine where they're upending the entire industry. Um, but let me just say this as something to keep in mind. There will come a day where we'll be talking about another company on the right, on the left, and we'll be talking about Amazon on the right, unless they're able to continue to innovate and stay on top of what is coming next. So um, that's just, that's just uh, something to keep in mind. So what do we all want in our business? Uh, we, we all want something, right? Or we all want several things, whether that's we want to uh, to be leaders in our community, we want to be leaders in our industry, we want to give opportunities for employees, we want to make more money, we want to uh, go into new markets. Is there anything else here that I'm missing out? What else do people want in their business? I'll call people out unless you guys start to kick in. Pat, what do you want for the Sugar Skulls? Um, definitely to get our name out there in the community, be more of a, you know, well-known in the area, especially being a new team, new business such as ours. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and actually, you know what, Pat, why don't you give us a, a 10 second spiel on the, uh, the Sugar Skulls so we're all kind of in the know. Yeah, absolutely. So we're the new team here in Tucson. We're an indoor football team. We played down in the downtown at the TCC. Uh, 2019 was our first year in the league. And, uh, you know, with everything going on, 2020 had to be postponed, but we're on track to play in 2021. We're looking forward to it. Uh, our schedule actually came out a couple of weeks ago. So we're starting in April. So if you guys are interested in coming out and checking out a game, let me know. Great. Um, so Matthew, what do you want in for your business? What is it? Uh, it what do you want in the end for your business? Um, no, I think I, beyond being a leader in, in our industry in construction, um, we want to be uh, indispensable and integral to our community as well. Community that we build in, uh, we want to help build that community. Right. And so give us a spiel on the construction company you work for. Uh, DPR Construction, we're... Uh, nationwide construction firm. We have 34 offices plus offices in Singapore and in uh, uh, Germany. Uh, we do work in five core markets, uh, healthcare, higher ed, um, life sciences, corporate commercial, and, uh, and advanced tech. Uh, we like challenging projects. We like highly technical projects. And we like to partner with our customers and find ways of meeting their goals, helping them meet their goals and their needs. And when we strive to be uh, the, the, the best in our market. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll, I'll call out one more person. Uh, Janet, uh, what do you want for your business? Okay, what about Doug? What do, you, what, what do you want for Tech Launch? Um, mine's pretty easy and you'd all love it. I want all of you to be successful because I need our, our ecosystem to grow and for this ecosystem to be recognized as a real innovation destination. So Doug is, uh, as I you mentioned- I have something, Manny. Sure, go ahead. Um, I would like the ability to have foresight into how I can evolve because I know that the market's going to change, but I want to stay relevant. That's awesome. That's a great segue. So how we're going to get there is by, to, by growth, right? 
a lot of people in business, uh, you know, this is a buzzword of, you know, growth. How am I going to grow my business? And the only way you're going to be able to provide for all of those uh, elements that we just discussed, as well as your own personal elements, is to continually grow your business. And, uh, and I'm going to uh, give Adam the opportunity to discuss why growth is so important and some of the things that, that we understand about growth and about a decline in your business in, uh, in two quarters can really give um, certain death to your, uh, to your company. So Adam, this is a good segue for you to, to chime in and talk about growth. Sure. Uh, back about a decade ago, MIT raised $50 million to do a study to try to forecast what would make, uh, a, how to predict the success of companies that were funded by venture capitalists. So they went to look at startups. They did a two and a half year study. They covered pretty much the entire spectrum of everybody that had been invested in by the venture capital community. And when they published the report, they came out with uh, the conclusion that there was one factor that predicted the success of uh, startup companies and nothing else. There was only one. You couldn't tie it to the leadership. You couldn't tie it to education. You couldn't tie it to industry. Couldn't tie it to funding. You couldn't tie it to uh, sources of money. You couldn't tie it to or, or amount. It, there was nothing that correlated with success with one thing, and that was revenue growth. Revenue growth was the number one predictor of success of all startup companies. And with that, they started to, we started to look around and realize that what happens is when a company grows, it covers a multitude of sins. You know, you're spending money, you're making things happen, but revenue growth keeps bringing it in. And revenue growth demonstrates relevancy. If your revenues are growing, people are spending their money with you. If your revenues aren't growing, they're spending their money somewhere else. And we started to see that people would say, well, how do I do relative to my industry? And I'd say, it doesn't matter. You know, like if, if you were selling um, horse feed, and you started seeing the sales of horse feed were going down, but hey, you're doing as good as the other guy selling horse feed. You're ignoring the fact that automobiles are making you irrelevant, right? So it's, does, it's not this thing of what am I doing relative to my industry? It's literally how much is my absolute revenue growth? And that is the thing that, re that will determine if you're relevant. If you're growing and you're growing revenues well, then you are relevant. If you're not growing your revenues well, then I don't care what your profits are. It really doesn't matter. You're losing relevancy and you're gonna find yourself in big trouble. The second thing is recognizing how much growth is necessary. If you keep in, fact, in mind that inflation grows at about 2% a year and the economy grows at about 3% a year, then you have to make 5% a year just to tread water. If you want to have any significant improvement in your business, like you want to pay yourself a bonus, you have to grow two points on top of that. So the baseline growth to just maintain relevancy is 7%. And if you really want to do well, you need to be up around 10 this shocks a lot of people because they think, well, you know, well, hey, wait a minute, we had a pandemic last year, we had all these problems, and why do I have to grow so much? You know, it's, isn't it okay for me to slip? And then take a look at the companies that are doing well. I mean, look at Microsoft, look at Apple, look at Netflix, look at uh, Facebook, look at Twitter. I mean, all, all, well, they're all growing, right? They're all growing. And so that's the number one thing you have to recognize. Either A, you are providing people what they want and you're therefore growing. That is how you maintain relevancy. And it's the number one metric. Absolutely. And uh, you kind of uh, hit the nail on the head here with regards to why it's so important to grow. And uh, really for, for our community here, at least in, in uh, Southern Arizona, um, we're, we're the same as many other communities hit by the pandemic, but yet there's still business thriving. There's still opportunities that are everywhere. It's just a matter of being able to uh, align your business to uh, growing trends. And uh, you know, we're gonna talk about why it's important to understand trends. Uh, but ultimately, what Adam, like Adam said, it doesn't really matter how you compare yourself to your peers. It just matters on how much you're able to uh, satisfy your customers. And so uh, there's four major trends. By the way, any questions so far, any uh, thoughts? Okay, good. Uh, there's four major trends that are uh, part of the next decade that we have identified as far as um, you know where the world is going, where we are now, where it's going. And, and certainly you can think about that as a, um, an important factor in your business. Whatever business you're in, you will, you will be affected by these trends. There's absolutely no way around that. And uh, those trends are around um, AI, around mobility, around the gig economy, 
and uh, around asynchronous communication. And so somebody says to me, well, you know, my business is not, not that. I am a physician. I've got a, uh, a, you know, a clinic. Why do I care about AI? If somebody, I've got a person answering the phone. Why do I care about that? And that same person might say, uh, I don't care about gig workers. All my employees are uh, part of my company. They're all W-2 employees. And what people don't realize is that the, uh, the ripple in the pond goes well beyond what you're able to do in your business as um, the people that service you as your vendors are all gonna be part of the gig economy. The people that, uh, that you're interfacing with uh, as far as when you call in to the insurance company, guess what? You're interfacing with AI. Um, and uh, the trend around, around the corner for a lot of, I'm just using doctors as an example, but the uh, telemedicine, right? The whole pandemic here has shifted everything over and what was already happening has only been accelerated by the pandemic. And so, you know, what I don't like to hear is the excuse of, well, well I'm going to throw my hands up because the pandemic is here. I'm just going to wait it out. Well, it's not going to change. Uh, we are in a trajectory right now that has been um, already started by uh, before the pandemic and is just accelerating through the pandemic. And we're not going to go back to the way things were. So, Adam, I want to, I want to hear from your thoughts on um, why we're not going to go back to the way things were. Why are we uh, in a new world today? Well, evolution never works backwards. It never has, never will. It's not the way it goes. It always evolves forward. So to understanding how things evolve, what we want to do is recognize how change actually happens. We tend to think of change as being incremental. You know, things just get a little bit better over time. But it turns out that's not how change happens at all. It's not how evolution happens at all. I mean, take, for example, long-tailed versus short-tailed monkeys. Uh, long-tailed monkeys were around for a long, long time. And then in a period of about six years, they all disappeared and were replaced by short-tailed monkeys. Well, why does that happen? Well, it's because there's a change in the environment. And when long-tailed monkeys were very adapted to their environment, they did well, they succeeded, they bred. Whenever the environment changed, the long tail was less beneficial, the short tail was more beneficial, the long tail will die off, and the, new, the short tails emerge, they're more successful. So you see this dramatic change happened in a short period of time. And that's the way change happens everywhere. Think about how many of you had a, D, a VHS player in your house, VHS, and you watch tapes, and then you got a DVD player, and you were watching them all the time, right? And you're running down to Blockbuster, Hollywood Video, or somewhere. And then it seemed like overnight, like really overnight, because it happened in a period of 12 months, you quit doing that. You quit doing it entirely. You put the VHS tapes in the closet, you never pulled them out again, and you started streaming. And you just completely changed in a matter of about 12 months. The whole, you know, this whole industry around, built around VHS tapes, DVDs, and um, players, and, and, and renting and buying these things disappeared in about a 12-month time frame. Because we made this dramatic shift to streaming, because why? Well, the environment changed. We suddenly had all this bandwidth. And when the bandwidth came along, I didn't have to be bothered with going to the stores to pick it up or return it. Um, and, and it really didn't really, I realized I didn't really want to own the thing and keep it in the closet because I rarely watched it more than once anyhow. So streaming just made the natural solution. So the key here is to recognize that change happens in big disruptions. It doesn't happen incrementally. And, and what we mostly don't understand is how to manage through disruptions. Because we, with an assumption that change is going to be incremental, we try to go at running the business where we always have, we, you know, get a little bit better every year, which is effectively, you know, driving the bus, looking in the rearview mirror, hoping the road's going to be the same in the for, for future as it's been in the past. Instead, what we have to do is recognize that when you get a disruption, what it's doing is it's indicating that there's going to be, you know, the future is going to look very different from the past. The world has changed and the pandemic is, is part of that now. We've dramatically changed. So, you know, we all had started shopping online the pandemic made us shop online a lot more. We all had started doing some work from home. The pandemic made us do a lot more work from home. Uh, all the technologies were already there. The opportunity was already there. We were just sort of hanging on to the old ways. When the pandemic came along, the disruption happens, then boom, we lurch forward, we accelerate the trends, and we start to, to take advantage of the technology and the trends that are out there that we can utilize. And that's what we're seeing happen right now today. And we're starting, so what are the, that's where these four big trends come in. What happens is your business is going to be more successful if you ride on the trends. You know, don't fight trends. Trends are, trends are like a river. If you fight trends, you're like being in a canoe trying to paddle up river. That's hard. Just trying to stay in place is hard. 
what you want to do is go with the flow, right? You want to go with the trend. So the more you can align yourself with the trend, the more you can make yourself mobile, the more you can add artificial intelligence, the more you can utilize the gig economy and allow people to interact with you asynchronously, the easier it is for your business to grow. Absolutely. And I, I'm reminding here, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that the idea of uh, disruptive innovation has been around since the birth of time, really, as the birth of man in one form or another. And so uh, uh, the greatest example that is the most relevant in my mind, that's the easiest to explain and it just sticks is what Adam mentioned, which is Netflix. Uh, you know, we, do you want to be Blockbuster or do you want to be Netflix? And so the, the, the crazy thing about Netflix is they disrupted themselves a couple of times, right? Because they really stuck to their true value and understanding what they really delivered was entertainment. And so remember back in the day when Netflix was first uh, out there, uh, you, would, you would go online and you'd pick your, your DVDs and then they'd mail them to you and you could keep them for a week or for whatever you want and you send them back. And that was their thing, right? They delivered these DVDs and that was great. And they were making lots of money and the investors and the stock market, everybody loved the, uh, the way they were doing things. And then the, the executives and uh, the leadership, Reed Hastings and so forth, made a decision that was not popular with the, uh, their uh, stockholders and, and really the, the industry in general. Okay, we're gonna take uh, five of these warehouses, we're gonna shut them down and we're gonna take all that money that we would normally be making by you know, shipping these DVDs around and we're gonna invest them in a hundred engineers in this basement working on something called streaming. And the investors said, are you effing crazy? You're, you're basically killing the cash cow. You're taking that goose and then you're just gonna snap its neck. And, and so the leadership, it's all about the courage and saying, you know what? Yes, we're gonna do that. And here's why, because we see what's coming in the trend of, of streaming. <clears throat> and we see that and we're gonna put, we're gonna move all of our chips in that direction uh, we're going to keep two chips over here, which they did. They still actually maintained the, the DVD thing, but it was one tenth of what it was. And then it became one, one, one hundredth eventually. And then they did it again. They did it again because when they saw that streaming was becoming ubiquitous and commonplace, they did it again. And they said, you know what? We're going to actually become a producer of content. And all the way, they're still doing what? They're still delivering entertainment. And so if you're a fan of Schitt's Creek or any other Netflix original, that is what they're doing, right? They moved in to become the biggest media production company in the world. And in a brief number of years, they usurped all the other companies that uh, were doing that. The, the stodgy, you know, MGM and all the other production companies that were, uh, you know, still, still around, by the way, but now they're having to shift their focus to the point where um, it was just announced recently that Time, um, was it Time uh, uh, Warner is gonna be producing, uh, all movies are gonna come out streaming as well as in the theaters. Right. Remember back in the day, they'd like put a movie on, um, you know, the big screen. And then like three months later, it would be, show up as a DVD. And then for a while they were putting stuff on the big screen and like two months it was streaming. Now it's gonna be all at the same time. So that means that movie theaters are, are going to be basically, uh, this is the final nail in the coffin, or they're going to have to adapt in some way that is going to um, sort of stretch their, their, with the way they do things today, because it's all changing. Any, uh, any thoughts or questions? Yeah, but I guess it depends on, you know, when you are going to establish your innovative ideas. Like, for example, the microRNA ideas, which is now based, uh, the COVID vaccine is based on, a, on a mRNA. Right. Uh, 20 years ago, the, the mRNA was, was uh, introduced. And yet, the scientific community was so adamant because they said that that would be dangerous to uh, introduce into the body. So it dies down. So come COVID-19, then that micro the, the mRNA just you know just just was just uh, like a magic. So uh, innovation has in the right time sometimes, but sometimes if it's not being accepted by the 
community. It will just die down. How many, how many innov innovative ideas that has been introduced that, has, that, that, it, that it didn't come to fruition? Yes. Yeah, there's lots of, uh, if you look at the history of innovation, uh, a lot of it is about timing, right? Uh, and so does that really, then it, is it really innovative if it's at the wrong time? And, you know, if you think about innovation is, uh, you know, giving customers what they want in a new and better way, um, I'm reminded of a, of, a, of a tool that Microsoft developed and I will give somebody a, uh, I'll take somebody out to lunch, except those that know the answer already. If you can tell me the name of the handheld device that Microsoft launched back in the day to compete against the BlackBerry. You have 10 seconds, go. Is it a Palm Pilot? Nope. It was called the Kin. The Kin. They, they launched this thing called the Kin. They spent about a billion dollars with a B, a billion dollars to create this device that was going to be on everybody's little handheld device. And you can look it up on um, online. It's there, the Kin. They released it and they pulled it from the shelves two months later. It was such a disaster that in the end, it was like a textbook of the way you should not do things. At the same time, you look at the iPhone. The iPhone, they spent about $200 million to develop the iPhone. When they, when they first had the iPhone, there was no like, there was so many buggy issues with the iPhone, but guess what? They came in at the time when people were, were hungry for having uh, this platform to be able to have your stocks, to make uh, phone calls, have your calendar, play games. And so now everybody has a, a smartphone, right? Because they came out at the right time with the right platform for, uh, you know, the iPhone was the, the reason why it was such a success is because it was a platform for a lot of apps. If they would have come out with no apps, which is by the way, what Microsoft did, why they didn't succeed, it, then, then it wouldn't be, it would be, be next to the kin as one of the biggest failures of all time of a product launch, but they didn't. Be, why? They recognized the emerging trend of both the um, availability of the, te the technology, uh, the need for having these apps at your fingertips, having the app store and developers ready to go. So when you launch, you actually have things you can, you can actually deploy. It was just, it was a mastermind effort. Uh, but in the end, it was about the right time, having the right market and the right technology. The trends are extraordinarily important. The unfortunate thing is that we tend to teach people in business to do planning based on the past. Uh, you know, we say, you know, who are our customers? What do we sell? What are our products? What are our regions? And then we try to extend those lines. Uh, that, that's almost 100% of what we do in planning, especially if it comes out of financial planning or something like an ERP system. And it turns out that that's doom because eventually the world will change and external forces will impact your business. And so the really success when we want to draw that the divining line is building your planning around trends and looking at the future and figuring out where you want to go. And what we know is that innovations that help you to be along the trends, to move people along trends, make a lot of money. And companies that go that direction make a lot of money. So if we, you know, Sears, Sears could have been Amazon, but instead they wanted to keep their stores open. You know, they wanted to run their stores and the warehouses and the business they had. So they kept putting money in what they knew how to do rather than going off where the trend was. That was a big mistake that they made. Segway made the same mistake though. I mean, I, in my world, you get to see a lot of cool stuff. I get to see all kinds of really interesting innovations. But a lot of times I'll sit there and say, how does this help me do my life better? You know, Segway was a really cool thing, but the problem was it didn't help me do my life better. You know, it didn't, Tesla does. The electric car really does help me make my life better. In fact, those little electric scooters that I can rent to bomb around in big cities make my life better. But the Segway didn't, right? There was no real value proposition to it. So the key to this sort of planning and thinking like a successful innovator is to start with trends. You start with saying, what are the trends and how can I do something that will help those trends, that will augment those trends and move people down the road of those trends. Yes, 
And, and, you know, the ability to, uh, to adapt and to align your business with trends is what's going to separate you from the, the pack. Uh, there's an executive that once told the CEO of Disney uh, to avoid uh, going to the business of trombone, trombone oil. So you think about, you can be the best manufacturer of, uh, of trombones, right? The, uh, the instruments. And so there's a market for oil to oil the trombone, right? But in the end, who's going to buy that? How big is that market? And so we get we fall in love with our, our business because of whatever reason. It's our passion, our, you know, all these sort of like things that we, we hear in, in uh, business communities. Focus on your core, you know, focus on your core, Pat. You, you got to do this, right? You focus on it. And in the end, it, it really defies um, the truth because if you're not able to stay relevant, you're going you're gonna to lose everything. And so uh, this is why this, this is so important to realize and why we felt compelled to create this course called Think Innovation, because it really brings together all of the, of the learning and features that we've put together to teach you how to be um, uh, alive and open to the idea of innovation, how to retool your business, how to be, um, here's a good list of stuff here, uh, you know, why it's support to innovate, we have some very usable tools you can use to, uh, to actually do some better planning. When you plan in your business, like Adam was mentioning, you want to look in the, in the windshield, right? And not in the rear view mirror, which is the way things are done now. I mean, how many people have been in a, a, a planning session where the first thing you talk about is, all right, how do we do last year? <laughs> right. Or how do we do the year before that? Or, okay. Uh, as far as a sales target, uh, you're going to be asked, uh, Matt, Matthew, next year, we want you to grow 10%. Or Jerry, next year, next quarter, you got you to grow 20% because last year, the same quarter, we were at 1 million. We want you to be at 1,200,000. It's the way business is done across the board. And it's basically all wrong because something can come up. And in a matter of three months or less or two months or six months, you can be doomed. Right. If you are in, um, if you're a wheelwright back in, in 1910 and you're making wheels for, uh, for carriages and you're wondering why you're not selling as many, right? You're, you're making them and your whole business and your equipment and your people that you train are all about making wheels for carriages. And, and ultimately, 10 years later, this new horseless carriage comes out that redefines the way things are done and you find yourself out of business. Now you find yourself maybe uh, still surviving, but you're so, surely not thriving. And as businesses, <laughs> we want to align ourselves to, to be able to thrive and go back to what we talked about, which is the idea of growth. All right, so that basically concludes our um, sort of our uh, slide part of the hour here. So we want to make sure we give enough time for Q&A. So, um, and Manny, since I question. since I shared the Excel doc with you, will you follow up with everyone who registered so they sure. can contact you for more information too? Absolutely. Fantastic. Yes. Who's got questions? You know, we we love uh, to curate unconventional wisdom. <laughs> it's what Adam and I just like salivate over unconventional wisdom, right? Focus on your core is un is conventional, but in the end it's not going to serve you for the long term. Right. Yeah, kind of uh, thinking out of the out of the box. Huh? Well, we like to use a term. So if you're thinking out of the box, you're still in the box, right? You're still in the box. You're trapped in the box, but you're thinking outside. We like to use a term to get out of the box, then think. It reframes your mind. And, and so the, let me go actually go back to the course. <clears throat> this course is about changing your mindset. Having a, a nice book like I've got over here that's, that's bound and beautiful in the background is great, but it's not going to serve me when I need it. I'm not going to remember what was on page 12. And so what we want to do with the course, what we're doing with it is changing your mindset. So we worked with some experts in adult learning so that we can actually uh, change the way you think. And uh, you can Google this yourself. There's a whole uh, world of science, which souvenir, of course, is since you, this is your background, you understand uh, neuroplasticity, right? The ability to reprogram your mind and uh, and really start thinking about things in a different way. 
Um, how many people out there have ever, like, you're going to buy a car? Like, you know what? I kind of want to buy a, a new uh, uh, four-door F-150. And then all of a sudden, you look around everywhere and you see four-door F-150s running around. Probably not a good example because they're the most popular car in the world, but maybe another car. I want to get a, um, a two-door Cadillac, right? Boom, you start seeing two-door Cadillacs everywhere. And that's actually, there's science related to why. It's not some magic fairy, you know, uh, giving you these cars. It's actually the part of your brain is now open to recognizing when those cars are there. They've always been there. Now you're just able to see them. And so in the same way, we're changing our mindset to think like an innovator. I like you that. Think about, for example, set... oh, sorry. But no, I was going to say, do you have a set date for when your next class begins? So our class is an on-demand online course. There's uh, uh, almost 30 videos or 30 lessons. I think there's 27 lessons. And each lesson has three components. It has, it has a, the first component is Adam and I talking about a particular subject. I might introduce something like, what is innovation? And then we go through and discuss that for uh, a, a bit. And then the second video is, a, we call it the integration video, where we'll actually give you some actionable items to take in your business and then the, the third video is really the exercise. So every lesson has an exercise that, uh, that we want you to do because it helps to reinforce um, the learning. And one other thing I'll mention about the, the way we, we design this course is, you know, at the end of the day, it's all up to you and you're gonna find the time or not to do this. But as part of the adult learning feature, we want you to, to have 20 minutes, 30 minutes of time without this thing right? Put this in another room, put the dog in another room, uh, eat a light snack so you're not starving, uh, drink some water, and really focus in on this. And there's some things that we, we actually teach you to do so that you're able to retain this because you're not going to learn, um, I don't care what people say, you're not going to learn as much if you're driving to work uh, listening to something, right? You're going to learn, don't get me wrong, there's value in that. It's, it's, it's sort of like a, a meal, you're going to digest it nicely but you're not gonna actually really make it part of your thinking, um, which is uh, what we want you to do here. Adam, you were gonna say something? Uh, yeah, I was gonna point out, so this, this idea of get outside the box, then think. Uh, when people try to think outside the box, you fall into that GM sort of trap. Some, somebody could say, well, uh, what, could, could there be an electric car? And you could have a brainstorming session. Well, sure, you could have an electric car and you talk it through. But then shortly after that, people start saying why it's impractical. You know, well, the batteries will only go 100 miles. Um, there wouldn't be any place to get them uh, recharged except going home. So you'd have range problems. Um, it, the car is going to be too heavy because the batteries are too heavy and steel and it's going to be way too heavy. It won't perform very well. So you have the brainstorming. It goes, well, you thought outside the box, but then once you're back, because you never got outside the box, the box thinking will eventually kill the idea back off again. So what you see that's different in a place like the Tesla is where they sit down and say, okay, what would be good about an electric car? The problems come up and they say, well, how would it solve the problem? You know, instead of being in the box, I'm outside the box. I got to solve this problem. I got to make the car lighter. I got to make the batteries go farther. I've got to make uh, put put charging stations up in places. And how would I do that? And that's what you see Tesla fight its way through to become the kind of company that it has become. And the same thing with Amazon. You know, how do I get people to put more products on my, my site, et cetera? And that's what I think we try to do in this course is say, you get, we try to get you out of the box for a while to start thinking, what is it people really want? And can I deliver what they really want instead of just keeping delivering what I've always done? Um, you know, not that what you've done was wrong, but you know, am I prepared for change? Am I prepared? Is my mind prepared to do things differently? Can I see it? Will I see it? As Manny said, will I see it happening? I used to go around 20 years ago and I would talk to people and they would say, everybody had a smartphone and I would say, 20 years ago, how many of you have a website on, on your phone? You know, your website's optimized for this. And how many of you have an app? And, you know, I could walk into companies all the time and they didn't have that. And I would say, well, you've got the tool. Why haven't you used the tool? And they're sort of like, well, uh, well I'm spending all my money doing what I always did. And that's what our course is about. How do you reallocate your time? How do you reallocate your resources? How do you start to actually plan for the future instead of planning from the past? Yeah. Right? Figuring out where you want to be and then making the path to go there rather than just trying to constantly extend. I think that's where the course comes in and can really help you. It's, it's a different way of planning. It's a different approach. But the thing is, it works. 
It's the one thing that we know, it gets you to where you're ready for change because then you're on the trends and now you're able to really focus on how do I make those growth goals happen? Every business on this uh, uh, tic-tac-toe square thing here can benefit from our course. And really, I mean, Jerry, I know the kind of business you're in, uh, Link Engineering, there's a huge benefit for this in being able to think about your current business is developing brake system test, test systems, right? Yeah. So how do you retool and really launch in a new direction? People still need to get from A to B. They just need to go, uh, we just need to retool the way you think in your business so that you can create test systems for all this new autonomous vehicles. You can do test systems for uh, electric vehicles. Um, and again, because of the nature of where we're going as one of these trends, how can you align your business to, to do that? Uh, souvenir, same thing. Greg, I just looked you up. You do uh, uh, educational sales. I mean, everything here is a matter of how can you retool your, your business? And it, it isn't always, um, you know, sometimes it's just a slight course correction. Sometimes it's a, it's a real hard, long look in the mirror and saying, you know what, I'm going to close the doors because I'm going to open up another one somewhere else. And so building that courage doesn't come from the ether. It has to come from within. And, and we can make some recommendations on some pretty amazing books you can start your, your journey on, on that realization. And Pat, I mean, you're, you're plowing new ground here with the sugar skulls. And uh, I mean, the way that the whole football NFL, that it's just all changing. And you've got to be on that leading edge. And if delivering uh, arena football to our community here, uh, if you do it right, you're going to be able to, to pack that hall. Of course, when, when we all have masks and the, the vaccine, but still you're going to be able to pack that hall and be able to, to grow uh, and create a, a world-class uh, team here in Tucson. Right. But, but, but again, I, I wonder how, how can you balance this incremental versus revolutionary uh, innovation? So I heard- uh, well, Without going into your death. Yes, so there are some very specific things we talk about. Uh, one of these things is the idea of blank space. And so blank space, and it was actually referred to by Sir Richard Branton initially by the term white space, but we changed it and called it blank space, is an actual uh, thing you can do in your business to carve out a team to go after a new direction, but in, in a way that gives them uh, almost carte blanche. Because the last thing you want, and I, I suffered from this when I had my company, we were a service company and we were doing uh, engineering services. And uh, there was about six or seven products that we wanted to launch. And I remember uh, uh, one of them was uh, actually a pretty cool idea is using a little dongle, a little IR temperature sensor for your phone that you could take a, um, a bottle of wine. This is not wine, obviously, but you could, you could go like this and you could make sure that the wine was the right temperature. And we called it Vino Right. And we had the technology, we had everything laid out. The problem was, is that every time I had one of my engineers work on it, Okay, Chris, you're going to work on this. This is your thing. A week later, we got a giant uh, project that fell in our lap. Okay, Chris, you got to put that away. You got to come work on this other project. And then so forth and so on, right? It, so we never actually committed to white space. And so there are some actionable things you can do and, uh, and to create and, and make space for you to uh, enjoy white space and, and, or sorry, blank space and be able to uh, take your company in, in a new direction. Yeah, but but again, without diluting your force, right? Because you, you, if you carve out some of your team, then do you think it will it, it will divert on your vision on 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 also your purpose on how your company is doing? Or, yes, well, that, and also that's it the is, idea. It, it's money, right? No, well, that's the idea. You you either want at the end of that 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 uh, exercise, the uh, blank space exercise you want one of two things to happen. You either want to take that blank space uh, project and say, that was a good exercise. We learned that we want to, don't want to go in the direction. Or you want to snap that goose's neck and say, oh, we're going to kill the cash cow. Or we're going to go in this new direction, like what Netflix did. They had a, it took a lot of courage to go through and say, all right, all that money, the seven warehouses all over the US where we deliver DVDs to everybody, and we're going to, we're going to close five of them down. That took a lot of courage. And when everybody was saying, hey, Netflix, you know how to deliver stuff in the mail. Why don't you become like a delivery service and you can ship 
you know, M&Ms and, uh, and, you know, toothbrushes and whatever, you can do that. And they said, no, sorry, we don't really know about that. That was a necessary evil. We really just know how to deliver entertainment. That's, a, that's the section around what we call strategic pivots and understanding what your value proposition is and understanding where the market is and then recognizing whether you want to invest in the current value delivery system or invest in a new value delivery system. And that's the decision making process that we lay out in the course. And, and when you, as you put more money into new value delivery systems, you're pivoting towards uh, new opportunities for growth. And so uh, th th what we do is get them on the table line them up, talk about them, and then figure out how you want to resource them. Uh, what, because in, in a normal world, we will always over-resource what we've done in the past and under-resource something new. That's why we see companies get into trouble all the time. That, that the, the system itself is designed. I've never walked in a company and walked up to the managers and said, how many of you are fully funded on all of your projects that you would like to do to make your business better for three years? Everybody's got a laundry list this long of how to make their business better. And so that pull for the money, that incremental money is extraordinarily strong. So what our course does is say, let's take that aside. Let's start to set, what are the new projects? What would they look like? How, how would you develop them? How much would they cost? And then how do I resource them? Can I stop doing some of the other stuff to come up with resources for the new stuff? And then that's the process we, we walk through in that section of the planning. I did, uh, when are you, go, are you going to pull the trigger? If, if it, it will not work. Well, a lot of that has to do with understanding um, your customer. I mean, the customer is, is the central resource. That is your market. When you look at your customer, that is your market. And so understanding the customer is, is absolutely fundamental in knowing when to pull the trigger and snap into Goose's neck, quote unquote. Uh, I just came up with that term. It sounds kind of cool. Um, but yeah, at that point in time, there's, you've got to make that decision and you can't be half in, half out. A lot of companies are basically dying the vine by being half in, half out. You've got to fully commit. Um, we have, if you listen to our podcast, we talk about this all the time. We talk about companies like Pizza Hut that were once the like bread and butter or bread and pizza of the industry, right? That's where I grew up, like pizza, that was pizza. We'd go to Pizza Hut, we'd drink the little tiny ice in the red cups and we eat, you know, you know the routine for many years. And then one day we stopped going why? Because we just get it delivered. The Pizza Hut didn't change. There, I mean, I drove by one the other day. It was the saddest thing ever. It was like two cars in the parking lot. And they were once the powerhouse. So that can happen to anybody. That can happen to even Amazon and Apple. So they've got to stay on point. And it takes a lot of, of uh, pepperoni to make those decisions to go in a new direction. <laughs> All right, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We could easily talk for hours because both of you are so fascinating, have so much information to share. So I, I think your course sounds like a really valuable one. And I'm grateful for your time and sharing it. And for everyone who registered, uh, do keep in touch with each other. I think this could be something that for sure could, like you said, benefit any company out there. And I wrote down two pages of notes, just really Great. good information. So thank you so much. And, uh, and please keep in touch. We're all really grateful for your time. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So everybody make sure to go to our website, sparkpartners.com. That's where you can find information on our course, as well as our podcast. I highly recommend you guys make it a routine to, uh, to listen to our podcast. That one you're okay to listen to while you're driving. Okay. <laughs> but really it's uh, they're 25 minutes long we're also on the radio uh 2 30 in the afternoon on saturdays on the am station uh 10 30 or you can just go to the podcast and, or the website and uh, it's a really good resource we talk about relevant things that are happening today uh and so we also have an ebook and anyway we can go on and on for hours but i really thank everybody for their time thank you so much thank you thank you everyone okay. thank you thank you Bye -bye.